All right, this video is going to be um, a bit of a revisiting of BTK inhibitors and um, going a little further than that, um, different types and categories of BTK inhibitors within that family. And then some interesting clinical trial data that shows you know, sort of where the, the state of that particular subfield is at. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is a quick recap of background because it's uh, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense unless you know, we've got this idea of exactly what their mechanism is. So remember, um, all blood stem cells are made from these hematopoietic stem cells that live in uh, bone marrow, and they then divide and start differentiating. Um, differentiating just meaning you know, becoming more specialized. Um, and so what we're most concerned with is this lymphoid progenitor line. Um, not that myeloid cells don't cause cancer, it's just not the focus of BTK inhibitors. So um, from that um, lymphoid progenitor cell, um, you can make natural killer cells, you can make T and B lymphocytes, um, the B lymphocytes, which can then also develop into plasma cells that secrete antibodies. And so um, these stem cells, particularly the lymphoid progenitor and these small lymphocyte precursors, um, this is where we're focusing. Um, these are stem cells. They have the ability to divide repeatedly um, for as long as they possibly want to which gives them a property that they need to have um, to be able to keep making more B cells and T cells throughout a person's life. Um, but it also makes them dangerous because that's also a property that cancer cells have to have. And so there's this sort of, um, you know, uh, almost seemingly contradictory idea that stem cells are, you know, regenerative and therapeutic in so many ways, but they're also very dangerous because they have that powerful ability that most um, cell types don't. All right, so if things go as planned, um, we activate a B cell, right? All of these cell types are showing you B lymphocytes or B cells. Um, when they're activated, and remember, activated just means that the cell bound to its antigen, um, the antigen being, you know, a protein on a virus or a bacterium, um, whatever's causing the immune reaction. And we want that to activate our B cell and have it divide into more B cells, that um, some of which will become memory B cells that we save for later in case the same particular antigen shows up again in another infection. We can fight it off more easily. And a lot of them will also become plasma cells that secrete antibodies into the blood. Right? If you want to make this happen, um, a couple things need to take place. Um, the first is the B cell itself, that's this guy, um, needs to bind its particular antigen with its surface receptor. Um, that surface receptor effectively is the antibody, right? And the terminology goes, um, we call it a receptor when it's stuck in the B cell's membrane. Um, we call it an antibody when plasma cells start secreting them into the blood, but it's really the same molecule. All right, so that's thing one. Um, antibody receptor, right, has to bind its antigen. They're showing this like on a bacterial cell. And the second thing is this helper T cell has to um, agree, right? So this MHC of the B cell, that's this guy in green, and this T cell receptor on the helper T cell, they both have to bind the antigen, which is being illustrated by this little red dot. Um, if that happens and they make direct contact, then this helper T cell is going to secrete some cytokines that stimulate that B cell and tell it to divide, right? Now, turning on that process means that some sort of intracellular signaling cascade has to happen. Um, otherwise, that B cell doesn't even know that it's supposed to divide. All right. So, turns out there are a handful of pathways that connect to each other. All right. The B cell receptor binding the antigen is one of them. They're showing the antigen is that little star-shaped molecule. And the other side of it is um, you have cytokine signaling right, coming from helper T cells, these toll-like receptors recognize other properties of pathogens. It's not really a big deal. The important part is um, all of these surface receptors that can stimulate the B cell to divide, um, they all funnel through cellular signaling mechanisms, and BTK is a central point that they all funnel into, right? And so if we developed an inhibitor for SYK or for PI3 kinase or MYD88, 
um, they would block particular um, portions of the cell signaling pathway. But think of the whole thing as being like a funnel, right? And our funnel is converging, right? All of these pathways are converging on BTK. And so if we can do our inhibiting at BTK or later, right? Realistically, you could also inhibit somewhere a little further down. Um, but there are other splits in the pathway. And this is realistically your best opportunity, right? So somewhere in um, this cluster is the central point in the pathway where if you inhibit, um, you can shut down replication from all angles, right? And that is our ultimate goal because the cancers that we're using um, these BTK inhibitors to treat, um, the thing they have in common is they're all derived from B cells um, that use BTK as part of their way to activate um, and turn on cell division. All right. Okay, so quick reminder on categories. Remember, um, BTK inhibitors come in two major flavors, um, reversible and irreversible. Um, the irreversible means that they are covalently bound to each other. Um, they meaning the BTK inhibitor and the BTK protein itself. Um, this has trade-offs, right? So a covalent um, irreversible inhibitor is nice in some ways because you can give a relatively low dose because as soon as the inhibitor binds, um, it forms an actual chemical bond with the enzyme, right? This is BTK. This is our inhibitor. Um, and so once it's stuck, that BTK is out of commission forever. It doesn't really matter if it's still floating around in a cell. Um, even if you stop taking the drug, um, that particular enzyme is out of commission because the inhibitor isn't going to let go. Um, if you have a reversible inhibitor, then you get this back and forth Right? The double arrows here are telling you inhibitor binds, falls off, binds, falls off. Um, the downside of that is you're going to need a higher dose. Right? But on the flip side, um, with the reversible inhibitor, you don't have to worry about it irreversibly binding to an off-target protein um, that you didn't really intend to impact. Right? With the irreversibles, you do have to worry about that because there are other enzymes that have very similar structures to BTK, and so since the irreversible inhibitors tend to build up over time, right, they bind and they don't let go, um, these irreversibles tend to be a little bit riskier and higher um, risk of side effects, okay? But it's always a case-by-case -case basis. All right. Okay, so um, we have a few different categories of drugs that we're looking at. Um, a lot of them have similar sounding names, and so this particular family um, is your um, non-covalent, um, meaning reversible binders. These are your covalent, irreversible binders. And um, the question is, right, which of these are going to be used as first-line treatment? And um, interestingly, are the mechanisms that cancer cells are going to use to become resistant to these inhibitors, um, do they carry over between the different types? And um, I'll make sense a little bit more about what I mean um, on that note in a minute. All right. So this paper um, really hits that concept of um, resistance. And I want to make a point of it because it's something we haven't talked about before. And it's an issue with all cancers, but um, uh, particularly with these BTK inhibitors. So um, this is our you know, newest class of BTK inhibitor that we're gonna be testing. And we're testing it on patients with BTK inhibitor refractory um, lymphoproliferative disorders, meaning um, lymphocyte, meaning B cell, and proliferative, obviously, meaning dividing, spreading, growing, the cancer part. But inhibitor refractory. Um, so the concept here is um, you can treat with BTK inhibitors, but remember, um, cancer cells aren't homogenous. They don't all have the same series of mutations, and new mutations are going to pop up all the time, right? And so if cells develop um, BTK inhibitor resistance, all that means is whatever mechanism the inhibitor works by, if a cell develops a mutation in the BTK gene, that prevents that inhibitor from functioning, then the inhibitor isn't going to work anymore, right? So for example, if this was our 
BTK, and this was our inhibitor, and we expect it to click into place and bind and inhibit. Um, if we had a mutation, right, where this BTK now had, um, right, a mutated active site, where it could still function, um, but now the same inhibitor that we tried to use the first time um, doesn't fit and it can't bind the active site. Well, if the BTK is still functional, then our drug effectively becomes worthless um, and isn't going to slow down growth or progression of, of cancer in those particular cells at all. All right, so when you give the drug, what you end up doing is um, you kill all the cells that have the version of BTK that is susceptible to your particular drug. But even if, even if just one cancer cell survives that has this mutation, um, then you expect those cells to divide and come back and basically pull the patient out of remission because right, they're not receptive to the drug anymore. All right, so our question is, can we develop different forms of BTK inhibitors that target the protein by different mechanisms so that if a certain cell type becomes resistant to um, you know, the first class of BTK inhibitors, well, our new class can approach it from a different mechanism, still inhibit, still give therapeutic value. All right. So um, as an example of how technical this can get, um, these um, early stage, like early approved BTK inhibitors, um, their function was to bind covalently to a very specific amino acid. Um, so when we say cysteine 481, that just means that it's amino acid number 481 in the cysteine protein, or sorry, in the BTK protein, and the amino acid is cysteine, okay? Um, what can happen is if that specific amino acid mutates from a cysteine into a serine, right? So when you read mutations like this, um, 41 tells you the position number, the 481st amino acid, um, this is a single letter abbreviation for cysteine. That's what the normal wild type version is. And then um, the second amino acid, a serine in this case, is what it was mutated into. All right? Since the chemistry of these covalent inhibitors was to bind to that very specific cysteine amino acid, if it's mutated, the drug's not going to work anymore. Okay? So that mutation made these cells resistant. Um, the drug no longer works anymore. Um, and you expect if any of those mutant um, B cells or lymphocyte derivatives were present um, with the mutation, they're going to come raging back and your inhibitor um, isn't going to function anymore. All right. And this isn't the only mutation that can cause resistance to BTKIs, but um, I thought it was a, a helpful illustration because I think it's easy to picture um, how if that amino acid is very specifically part of the mechanism of the drug, that if you mutate it, uh, mechanism isn't going to work anymore. All right. Okay, so our um, new, like to my knowledge, most recent class of BTK inhibitor that's actually in clinical trials um, is this um, pertobertinib um, hell of a name. And um, it's still a BTK inhibitor, right? So this is our B cell receptor. Um, this would be our cell membrane, right? And this is our active form of BTK, right? So this is a reversible inhibitor, um, but it binds by a completely different mechanism, right? Not by that cysteine residue that we were just looking at before. Okay, that was covalent binding and it was permanent, right? This is reversible, meaning it can fall on, fall off, and it binds to a completely different part of the protein. Okay, so instead of directly binding um, the active site, um, it's binding to a completely different location. Um, obviously, this is just sort of fancy graphics, um, but you can imagine binding somewhere other than the active site and um, having an on-off rate, right? So it can bind, it falls off, it binds, it falls off, but... It has pretty high potency, meaning it's not permanent, but this point um, about demonstrating nanomolar potency, um, nanomolar meaning you can give the drug in nanomolar concentrations, which, which is incredibly small. Um, nanomolar is, 
ideal, even if it's in like the triple or double digit nanomolar, single digit is crazy. Um, very, very, very low concentration. That's a great sign that it has high binding strength um, and probably high specificity, All right? And um, the long half-life, most drugs have a low to mid single digit half-life and um, a half-life of 19 hours is incredible. So we can give a low dose. Um, it lasts for a relatively long period of time and um, seems to be relatively specific to um, BTK compared to other kinases that are in the same family. All right. So the, the place that we're most interested in this is um, can this inhibitor be used in patients that have already developed mutations that make them resistant to um, the other classes of BTK inhibitor that are used as a first-line treatment. Okay, so in this particular paper, um, they're using it um, after a covalent BTK inhibitor, right? So the covalent ones are the irreversibles that were, um, you know, first developed. And so basically we're saying we have a patient that was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which means their B cells from their bone marrow are dividing out of control. And they already went through one full round of treatment using a first generation or possibly second generation covalent BTK inhibitor. It worked to some degree, right? It suppressed B cell division. They had some degree of remission, but now cancer came back. And if the first round BTK inhibitor isn't working anymore, it's reasonable to think that that's because they have mutations in their tumor um, that are making those cancer cells resistant, just like we talked about. All right, so that's what this is saying. These people had poor outcomes as their first round BTK inhibitors eventually failed, and they're conducting um, a phase one, two trial where these people that had relapsed or refractory B cell cancers, meaning again, round one, they got treatment, they came back. And we're gonna see if our new inhibitor that works by a completely different mechanism can kill those uh, tumor cells that are already resistant to the mechanism from the first um, round of BTK inhibition with uh, the covalent drugs. All right. Okay, I threw this graphic in here because um, I thought it was um, interesting as just uh, like partly a revisiting of um, statistics that we saw before. So what they're doing is um, they're dividing their patients into subgroups based on um, any different set of characteristics that they can think of for the most part. And then we're measuring our response rate. Okay, so for all patients, um, 203 out of 247 showed a positive response to the drug, right? And what they're effectively trying to get at here is compared to the average for the entire group, does subdividing by any of these particular characteristics give us um, a significantly better or worse response rate, right? And so remember um, what this line is showing you, the dotted line represents the average, right? That's why this one is perfectly on the middle because that represents all patients in total, right? So um, what factors helped? Um, any of these things that push us to the right of our mean means having that characteristic made the patient more likely to respond favorably to the drug, right? So um, being younger, um, interestingly, was actually a little bit worse and being older was better. Um, hard to explain that, but the effect was relatively small. Um, and so most of these didn't shift dramatically, um, but there were several, like particular mutations, for example, um, this mutation um, significantly decreased response rate, making the drug less effective. Um, and there were others that very slightly pushed it to the right. But the point that I want to highlight is no drug is ever going to work for every patient. And so they're trying to scan, okay, for future treatment, um, what patient characteristics can we screen for to find people that are more likely to respond positively to this particular drug compared to others? Okay, so another way of looking at this, um, they measured... Um, change in tumor size over time. And they measured it for every individual patient. 
So the x-axis, every one of these bars, if you zoom in close enough, um, each of these bars represents one person, right? And we've got several hundred people here. So what we're asking is over the course of treatment, um, did their tumor get larger or smaller and by how much? So you can see um, only a very, very small number had their tumors grow. Um, that represents people with cancers that were um, still resistant um, to this particular drug. Whereas um, in any of these that showed a significant decrease, we would say they were responsive to some degree. Um, that ranges from these lucky patients who saw an almost 100% removal, meaning their tumor was nearly gone, um, on a sliding scale all the way up to um, these individuals that saw almost no, or sorry, these individuals that saw almost no meaningful effect at all. This dashed line is showing a 50% reduction, which um, seems to be their cutoff threshold for what they deemed, you know, a, a meaningful positive response to the therapy, right? And um, that translated into um, survival rates where it's a little bit difficult to compare these because um, we don't have a true control, right? They're not going to give these people a placebo, um, but suffice to say they survived um, significantly longer than like historical data would show um, for people with this tumor if they were just completely untreated um, across the board. All right, so um, I hope this is interesting. It, il it illustrates a handful of interesting points about um, mutations within subsets of tumor cells and about, you know, uh, like multiple um, sort of generations of drugs within a similar family that can operate by slightly different mechanisms. Um, and it really hits home with the point that um, just because a tumor becomes resistant to a particular version of a drug um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be resistant to other variations um, of drugs that hit the same target, but via a different mechanism.